OK. <laughs> there was a <laughs> OK, now it should be working. So we are talking about words today. And the question, um, that, that's obviously a topic that has been dealt with uh, many times in very many different dis uh, perspectives. Uh, theoretical ones, typological ones, language specific ones. And here I want to add or revitalize possibly uh, an, a, a perspective that has something to do with spoken language and the practical field perspective on this issue. Inter alia, this will be the question of how the word works in transcription. Yeah, Transcription being the big topic from last time, as you may, may remember. Uh, somewhat uh, surprisingly, perhaps, um, we will first talk about syllables and intonation units. On the one hand, uh, taking up uh, or finalizing something I started at the end of the last uh, lecture. But it will also be um, important in the sense that I have been working on mostly on intonation units and a little bit on syllables. And I have developed uh, a certain framework how to approach basic issues with regard to these units. And this framework will be the model for the way I'm approaching the question of word. So I have to first uh, show something or explain how I basically conceive of uh, and the different um, aspects when discussing such fundamental notions as syllable, word, and intonation unit. So the major distinction I propose for syllables and intonation units is the one between a phonetic and a phonological definition. And that basically amounts to the same thing as a behavioral and a structural kind of definition or unit. Behavioral units are universal by definition, and structural units show different levels of activation or grammaticalization across languages. And what that means will be um, um, explained uh, shortly. Um, the word, I mean, all three notions, syllable, word, and intonation unit, um, of course, have some similarities, but they are also very different. That uh, should be very clear. Uh, from the beginning. One important point of difference between the word on the one hand and intonation unit and syllable on the other is that the properties of word units across languages are much more varied than the properties of syllables and intonation units. You know, so the word is in terms of cross-linguistic investigation, in, in terms of cross-linguistic definition, the most complex one. At the same time, I would claim that speakers and linguists are more aware of the differences between words across languages, uh, which they may not be so much as uh, <coughs> with regard to intonation units and syllables. Uh, one famous example being the fact that morphological typology has been part of the field for the last 200 years uh, to begin with. What they have in common, intonation units, phonological words, and syllable, uh, is that they are nowadays put together in a hierarchy, which is known as the prosodic hierarchy. They have different positions on that hierarchy, and I'm not totally an advocate of the, in, uh, of the prosodic hierarchy, but the prosodic hierarchy allows one to make certain observations and uh, statements. And one statement um, I uh, would like to make here is that I think that in terms of prosodic units, syllable, word, and intonation unit are the three ones that are universal, but that are really part of defining what spoken language is. And the other levels on that hierarchy are much more open to controversy, much more open to the question of whether Really, every language has a feed structure. I recently supervised the PhD thesis, which comes to the conclusion that that is not the case. The mora is possibly something totally different, and various other differences emerge here. So uh, um, many of you will have heard about this, the uh, heard about the distinction between uh, phonological words and grammatical words. That's what dominates nowadays the discussion of words in both typology uh, and grammatical theory. Uh, but what I would like to argue also on the background of what I just said about intonation units and syllables and what I will explain more about 
uh, these um, is that in my view more important than the distinction between grammatical word and uh, phonological word is the distinction between the word as primary datum, as primary data, versus the word as a structural unit or as, a, as an analytical construct, as you, if you want uh, to put it that way. Phonological words and grammatical words are both structural units and the, the main question in many ways of this uh, uh, lecture is the question what are actually the primary data uh, for words? Yeah? What, what's, what's, what kind of evidence can we have uh, for uh, the, the unit word which is not identical to the kind of evidence we normally use to analyze phonological words and grammatical words? Actually on the terms of structural, uh, on the level of structural distinctions, uh, there are actually three different word type kind of units, namely phonological word, grammatical word and the lexeme. I will not have to say anything about lexemes, um, but uh, just for completeness reasons I put it into this table. So the basic roadmap, the basic plan for today is first to talk a little bit more about the difference between what I have been calling primary data and structural units and then go on uh, to what to some proposals some ideas for what primary data for words or the word as a behavioral unit uh, could be as i already indicated i will illustrate the distinction between primary data and structural units with the help of intonation unit and syllable i'm not totally happy with the terminology primary data and structural units. One could also say primary data and secondary data. One could say behavioral units and structural units. There, I'm, I'm still undecided what the best way of putting it uh, is. The, so don't get hang, uh, hung up on the, on the terminology, but rather try to get the basic idea of what the distinction is. And then one can, of course, discuss whether that's a viable distinction or not. Okay, um, let's start uh, with the intonation unit at the point where we uh, mentioned the intonation unit uh, last time and some people probably have heard what I'm saying now here about uh, intonation units but so there's nothing really new here so please be uh, patient uh, for the next five minutes or ten and then there will be other... Uh, Man hört nichts mehr. Dein Mikro ist aus. Okay. Now you hear me again? Do you hear me? Now it works again. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't know. It's uh, it's not my. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> 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 so um, okay. Uh, the phonetic definition of the intonation unit uh, in a very strict version, namely taking a really only a single definitional criterion, is uh, the resets of the pitch level. That is, intonation units are defined by a coherent melody which has an onset and an offset. And the offset of one intonation unit and the onset of the next intonation units, there's a jump in the pitch. Yeah? So it can be higher, the, the restart, the next unit can be start on a higher level or it can start on a lower level. And I already uh, presented an, an example uh, last time from German, uh, where it basically you have four very short intonation units. Uh, the first one says something like uh, in Körbe gelegt, put into baskets. So it's from the pair story and the speaker says something and then hat er die Birnen in Körbe gelegt, put into baskets, is the first intonation unit, that were standing by, die bereitstanden, is the second um, intonation unit, aus seiner Schürze heraus, out, out, out of his apron, out, um, yeah, that's the third one, and the fourth one is a single adverb, painstakingly. Yeah, so overall the whole thing means then the man put the pears into the baskets that stood there from out of his apron painstakingly. But the more important point is, yes, you have the four intonation units and they end at a certain pitch level and the next one starts at a different one. Yeah, so in this case it's lower 
In this case, it's even lower. In this case, the intonation unit starts from a higher level than the offset of the preceding one. And the whole, thing's, whole thing sounds like this. You want to hear it again? Okay, so this pitch reset is the main criterion for, uh, in a, for phonetic intonation units. And then there are another other there are another number of phenomena that typically occur at intonation unit boundaries, phonetic type of uh, uh, phenomena, which in discussions of intonation units are also uh, standardly mentioned. There's the pause, uh, there's lengthening of final syllables, there may be a rapid delivery of initial syllables in the new uh, series. There's also uh, offset phenomena like creaky voice, etc. These are all important phenomena from a, pract a practical point of view. They also tell you something why intonation units are the way they are. Uh, but in terms of theoretically defining it properly, it's actually enough to have this criterion of pitch reset, is my claim. We can discuss that. Um, more importantly, for present purposes, the intonation unit as just defined as a phonetic unit which is defined by pitch reset, is uh, a unit of segmentation that is linked to the physiology of speaking and the cognitive demands on speech processing. So the crazy claim is you cannot speak without producing intonation units. Yeah, that's, the basic intonation, that's the basic unit of fluent speaking. And as such, they are uh, uh, universal and there are various kinds of sources of evidence for showing why they are robustly attested across languages or why they um, are part of the definition of what it means to speak. Um, there is one um, type of evidence which comes from perhaps a surprising type of uh, source and that's from machine learning. Um, people have shown that if you train a classifier or an algorithm on uh, chunking intonation units in on one language, like you, you, you train a, <coughs> a classifier, a boundary classifier uh, on English data, uh, then you can apply the same type of classifier to Chinese data and you get a reasonably uh, robust segmentation of the Chinese data into intonation units of the same kind as you did for the English uh, data. Um, I myself did a fairly uh, big project on boundary classification as it were by human annotators across familiar and unfamiliar languages uh, that was study, uh, published in this study in phonology. Um, it consisted in having a fairly large corpus of three, three hours and uh, more than three hours of spontaneous narrative speech. Um, uh, and uh, consisted altogether of 20, 27,883 words. And if you do a intonation unit boundary classification, um, then you basically, every word boundary is a possible intonation unit boundary. So at every word boundary you have to make a decision on is this an intonation unit boundary or not. Uh, and this decision uh, was being made by four students, uh, student interators. Um, and the interesting thing for uh, the topic of the universality of the intonation unit and its recognizability uh, was the fact that on the one hand the corpus included data where the, where the students, there were German students, um, knew about the languages, so they classified or they segmented uh, German, Cologne dialect and English kinds of narratives. They were, all, they were always pair stories, one should say, so the whole corpus is pair stories. Um, but there was also a second uh, and third group of um, narratives. One was from Papun Malay, which is spoken in Eastern Indonesia. And there are also, and there's a regional uh, lingua franca, and there's also, um, there was also uh, narratives from uh, three local languages in, in the Papua province of Indonesia called Woi, Waimaa and Yali. And uh, the important result is that if you look at uh, how the interrators, the students classified 
boundaries there, how they made the decisions, what's an intonation unit and what's not. The level of uh, agreement between them and the level of agreement with a, a master segmentation done uh, by uh, my co-authors co and myself uh, using um, uh, <coughs> Pratt measurements, etc., um, was that they were fairly high and they were fairly similar across the languages. It didn't make a difference whether people classified German or whether they classified Woi or Yali. So it didn't make a difference whether they understood what the narrative was or whether uh, uh, <coughs> they only could hear phonetic events such as pitch jumps, pauses, etc. Um, so this shows you that actually speakers of any, principally the, the claim is speakers of any language can identify intonation unit boundaries of any language. Yeah, we tested this for these uh, three sets. That's of course uh, still a long way to go to do the pairwise testing for 7,000 languages if you really wanted to do it totally properly. Um, but we have um, tried this and importantly uh, for a non-Western population as well with a different methodology, namely the so-called rapid prosodic transcription methodology, um, which allows you to test for similar kinds of agreements on a much lower level because it's you 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 hear a number of excerpts and ask are uh, asked to mark uh, boundaries um, in an in a, in a, in, a, in an audio of one minute or so, yeah. And um, <coughs> the whole methodology is explained in this paper by uh, Sonja Riesberg and others, as uh, quoted here where we basically, and that's the important addition to the previous study, in this study we actually asked Papuan Malay students, in addition to German students, to do the classification. And they did it in a similar way, I mean they did it at a somewhat lower level, but this can be easily explained for various reasons, uh, various practical and uh, environmental reasons as it were. But if you look at the paper and if you look at these figures here, which I have in my uh, presentation, you can see that the Papun Malay students segmented both Papun Malay and German reasonably well. And the German students segmented Papuan Malay and German reasonably well. Yeah? And there's an enormous, uh, as you can see in, this, uh, 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 in these figures, there's always uh, prominences and boundaries. And this testing works for boundaries. Intonation unit boundaries are really accessible. But prominences, what, what is really prominent, what is stressed, or however you want to call it, is totally much more language dependent and not, there is much less agreement about what the prominence is than uh, or, or, or whether we have an intonation unit boundary or not. Okay, uh, just to mention a final story, we just came out a dissertation by Christoph Brax uh, on a Sulawesi language, Totoli, again using the RPT methodology, uh, this time not with university students, but with broader segments of uh, a native uh, population in Indonesia. And again, finding there is reasonably good agreement on intonation unit boundaries in a similar setup as we did in the Papuan Malay study. Uh, <coughs> so we have machine, uh, uh, machine learning or machine classification of boundaries. We have human iterators of familiar and unfamiliar languages being capable of identifying intonation units. And there's actually some um, interesting work uh, done by uh, Israel, uh, Israeli uh, colleagues, in particular Maya Inba and her um, colleagues, who, is, who has shown with the data from Woi and Yali and Papun Malay, which I just mentioned before, um, that there is some correspondence between the rhythm of intonation, unit, of intonation unit chunking or segmentation and a certain level of brain waves or of brain oscillations. Yeah? So the brain basically is continuously uh, operating in, on, in wave levels on, on various kinds of cycles. Yeah? So they are faster 
uh, <coughs> oscillations and there are slower oscillations and the claim is that um, um, the brain oscillations you have at the delta level uh, that's basically the one hertz range is roughly corresponding to uh, what intonation unit uh, segments are like. So you, you have another kind of evidence for the relevance of uh, intonation units. For today, the main point, however, is that, um, is that phonetic uh, intonation units constitute a necessary segmentation level in speaking that can be measured and experimentally investigated, as I just uh, illustrated with various examples. They are by de definition universal as they are rooted in the physiology, on in the co physiology and cognitive underpinnings of speaking. And this is to be strictly distinguished, although of course they are related, uh, from what I call phonological uh, intonation units, which incorporates theoretical assumptions about the structure of spoken languages, and they are by necessity theory dependent and language specific. So the current most well known and most widely used framework for phonological intonation units is the one in the autosegmental auto metrical theory. Um, and this is definitely a very productive, I find, and helpful way of thinking about the structure of intonation units from a linguistic point of view. Uh, but this is not the same thing as a phonetic intonation unit. And the important point is uh, that languages differ in the ways in which they enhance and phonologically organize phonetic intonation units uh, in the way so that they become phonological units. Yeah, so phono phonological intonation units or intonational structure more generally is a result of grammatization or activation. Every language, every speaking in event involves a phonetic intonation unit, but whether a language uses boundary tones, whether it has one boundary tone or six boundary tones, whether the final lengthening is in some way rigidly organized or is uh, highly variable, and any other aspects of possible aspects of the phonological structure of an intonation unit, that's highly, highly variable. Yeah? And languages can be very different in this regard, and there may be languages where it is very difficult to say what the phonological intonation unit is, yeah? or what what the trappings of the phonological intonation units are, and in other languages we have a very, fairly elaborate intonational structure. And this idea or this term, the terminolo terminology of um, activation, um, actually I have taken from a, a work from Larry Hyman, which uh, the Aus uh, Africanist colleagues uh, um, here of course will know very well, um, and they will also know that Larry Hyman has written uh, repeatedly on the question whether the language Gokana, I don't know whether this is uh, correctly pronounced, has syllables or not. And he comes to the conclusion that it does not have syllables. And the point I want to say, uh, make here is he is probably correct in the sense that the, when you analyze Gokana, you do not need the notion of syllable. Yeah, that's basically the argument. He says, when I analyze Gokana, I operate with a template uh, <coughs> which consists basically of two syllables and I can describe all the restrictions and processes th that occur best with regard to this template. But he of course does not question the fact that Gokana speakers also have to have a temporal synchronization of, sp of gestures in speaking when they move the tongue um, and other articulators and they have to be coordinated and syllables basically, um, as you can see here in this slide, according to work that started with articulatory uh, gestural phonology with Brahman and Goldstein but is recently summarized by Xu, um, they basically have a temporal coordination function, syllables that is, and they can be defined by the synchronization of articulatory movements. So that would be a phonetic definition of syllables. And the claim would be Gokana has, of course, phonetic syllables as any other language because you can't talk without coordinating your articulators properly. 
There's also other types of evidence that probably also, uh, I think Larry uh, mentions that somewhere in, uh, in the work, that Gokana speakers can consistently syllabify uh, Gokana words and do possibly you have also ludlings and language play which involves uh, syllables. But that's a different question from whether Gokana uh, needs a phonological unit, uh, namely uh, <coughs> a syllable which, as um, I uh, already said, is not necessarily the case. Um, and that's in this context where uh, Larry introduced this uh, term of activation. And he says something like the activation is so, the activation of the syllable as a phonological concept is so slight in Gokana that all we have is the ambiguous interpretation of the CVV, CVV uh, that's the posodic stem maximum. So there is a one marginal phenomenon where you might need a syllable in order to present it, uh, uh, in order to analyze it. But um, he concludes then, as these and many other such examples amply demonstrate, phonological typologists should be concerned with characterizing and explaining these interesting variations in how phonetic substance is phonolo phonologized in different languages. Yeah, that's the basic idea. We have phonetic types of events that are universal, but they are activated, phonologized, grammaticized in different ways across languages. And that's, I think, now very clearly shown for uh, syllables and for intonation units. Um, and the question is, can we do <coughs> apply this kind of framework or this uh, kind of line of thinking also to words? Yeah, that's the main part or the second part of today's presentation. Um, since this is a fairly major boundary, as it were, in the presentation, I, I give, um, I stop here briefly, and uh, if there's any question of clarification that specifically pertains to this distinction between analytical constructs and behavioral units or phonetic units and phonological units um, in principle, then we could briefly discuss that now. Yes, please. I probably had a small clarification question about when you spoke uh, about those uh, studies when uh, where you compared uh, the way people uh, marked up um, uh, okay. speech data for um, uh, for several languages they didn't know they didn't speak and uh, you compared it with uh, uh, already with, with uh, markup that was already made by, by you and your colleagues, right? Yeah. Uh, was, it, uh, was this uh, control uh, markup uh, made according to... Uh, so w w uh, were you marking up these also phonetically or were there some also some language-specific phonological like rules that... Uh, no, we, we basically, for the students or for all participants in these tasks, we basically gave them very similar definition of the phonetic intonation uh, unit as I had on the slides. So they were told this is primarily about pitch jumps, but there can be also pauses, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And we applied the same. Yeah, we didn't. We did not analyze the data in terms of language-specific phonological intonation units. Yeah, no, that's. But you were, uh, you, I think you said you were comparing uh, what they did with uh, the data that was already marked up, uh, like professionally. Yeah, but that was kind of um, as uh, in in all these interator. Uh, uh, um, investigations uh, and or classification tasks, you typically have something like a so-called gold standard, right? And so our classification was called the gold standard and then we, we compared it <laughs> to what the others did and uh, when uh, they, they overlapped pretty much, yeah? So, I mean, there's, there's a very clear area where things become, that actually two areas where things become a problem. One is when you have a so-called latching of intonation units, as in this one example from the peer story I had, in Körbe gelegt, langsam, uh, etc. So when intonation units 
follow each other very short, shortly. Many people don't get that so easily. And on the other hand, if you have hesitation pauses, um, it can be tricky to say whether they involve an intonation unit boundary or not. But otherwise, we all agreed. Yeah? Whether we are Papuan or German or expert or student, etc. Okay. Mark, you had also. Yeah, I had a, a small comment. Uh, I, I totally agree with what you, with what you said about uh, syllables. And Gokana is not unusual in West Africa. There are several other languages where you can have these things with like up to five vowel lengths where you can have five different tones on them, etc. And you see, and the syllable is structurally not mm. relevant in yeah. those languages, but obviously, I mean, there are dual movements. Yeah. Well. But the, the one thing that I didn't fully understand, I think, is that, I mean, I see the, the opposition clearly between primary data and structural units for syllables, but less for intonation units. I see it as primary data, but could you say something more about the, the, the intonation units um, is basically the structural thing. If, if, if you go with the autosegmental method, then the question of whether you can say so, uh, make a distinction between so-called edge tones and pitch accent positions, the difference between uh, a small IP and a big IP and other uh, di distinctions, that would be uh, of what I would consider structural kind of uh, distinctions with regard to intonation units. It's, yeah, basically. Yeah, the kinds of, I mean, some people have apply this framework, which basically I found in, I find interesting autosegmental um, metrical um, intonation analysis as a kind of universal schema, which is, I think, wrong. So there can be languages which have edge tones and other languages don't have edge tones. And you basically have to agree on what is actually the kind of evidence you can bring for uh, calling something an edge tone and, and, and a boundary tone and uh, how you analyze two different types of um, uh, rises. Are they basically, um, is the one rise simply ha having a high tone and the other one having a low target and a high target? And questions like that would be uh, part of the international f structural analysis. But, uh, if I may, yeah, uh, it, it's rarely discussed in grammars, not like unlike syllables. Would you say that grammars should pay more attention? Yeah. Or would you say that they are less salient than syllables? Uh, it depends on, actually, it depends on the language. For some languages, it's very important. And of course, it should be part of the, of the um, standard uh, a structure of a grammatical description and it's it's coming more and more but I mean it's still of course the training is not yet 100% there um, to do these things and um, like this thesis I was quoting um, referring to from Christoph Brax I mean this is basically um, the language that we haven't written a grammar yet but he actually now did the prosody but on a in a 300 page book with lots of experiments, etc. So it's not real. Uh, currently, it's not totally realistic to say that in a grammar you have a complete uh, picture of the prosody. But definitely, you should think about um, if there are prosodic events and how you get to them, etc. Yeah. Um, asking the people uh, on Zoom, you can hear interactions oh, well this time. Uh, as it wasn't the case last time. Is that? Correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Um, so then I um, go on. And now the, the major question is, um, in a certain way, what would be a phonetic, yeah, in uh, using the terminology uh, uh, I have been using for intonation units and syllables, what would be a phonetic word? Um, but a word is uh, in, indeed a bit more tricky than syllables and intonation units and um, therefore I still don't have a good terminology as well. I call them here uh, for today uh, spoken word candidates. Um, and the first one is a bit similar to the machine learning um, evidence we had for intonation units. Um, and namely the, the um, observation that um, in 
child language acquisition, it seems to be the case that um, uh, when children, when babies are kind of confronted with this continuous stream of articulated sound, uh, you of course you have to have you have to start to get a hang on wha what the units is. Yeah? So what children or babies basically hear is an uns a seemingly un un <coughs> segmented kind of. Uh, of syllables and the question is how do you know uh, which of these syllables form word-like type of units and the basic uh, observation that has been played in the child acquisition uh, literature uh, uh, an important role in the last 15-20 years is the observation that if you have something like pretty baby a phrase like pretty baby the transition from pre to t, pretty, yeah, the, the, the transition from the pre syllable to the t syllable is much, uh, <coughs> is much uh, more uh, likely than the transition between the t and the bay from baby. Yeah? So the transition between the two syllables that make up one of the words, pre, t, and bay, b, they have higher probability of co-occurring in this sequence, while um, something like B and uh, like T and Ba from pretty and baby are less likely to occur um, after each other. Yeah, so there is a less, uh, there is a lower transitional probability, and uh, focusing on these transitional probabilities allows children to form hypotheses uh, about whether um, certain syllables, sequences of syllables form a unit or not. That's the basic idea. Uh, which in, um, in a certain similar way has also been taken up from um, a um, um, <coughs> uh, speech engineering point of view, one could say, um, in a project which I happened to be um, tangentially involved in um, that was colleagues uh, in Paderborn in Germany who um, worked on this problem of how you segment a stream of letters it is all written stuff into word-like units so they had a corpus um, of Wall Street Journal articles and they removed all word boundaries so they basically got uh, the whole uh, corpus in one single uh, sequence of letters, yeah. Power financial is a financial, you, ca you can see this at the beginning. And then they built an algorithm with, which also makes use of these trans transitional probabilities and certain Zipfian kind of predictions, which I didn't understand, and uh, other important uh, problems, uh, other important ideas that uh, go into uh, these so-called language uh, models. And uh, the outcome was that they basically could reinstate uh, the word boundaries um, to on the level as uh, shown below. Namely that basically Power Financial is a financial services concern that is 69% uh, held by Power Corporation of Canada at Montreal based holding company. Yeah, and you can see the two red one uh, red items where the segmentation didn't properly work, but otherwise it was possible with this algorithm without any learning. So they didn't operate with a dictionary. I mean, that would be very easy. Yeah, it's so-called unsupervised learning where they basically run the algorithm uh, on this data and get that. And here um, I come in with why Maa and Woi, which already were treated for intonation <laughs> unit segmentation. They also were treated for word segmentation and the results were surprisingly good. Yeah, they were basically on the same level as for English with the same algorithm. So somehow there is some, there is some statistical patterning in words across languages that can be picked up uh, by uh, um, algorithms that uh, segment or that <coughs> work on transi transitional uh, probabilities. Um, another potential candidate for um, primary data for words, um, again coming from a very technical 
domain um, is some uh, and, and specifically phonetics is um, uh, so-called domain initial strengthening. For this, you basically have to do electropalatography, where people get uh, some apparatus in, in their mouth and um, the, the contact between the tongue and the different places um, in, in the mouth um, uh, <coughs> are then measured for duration and intensity. Um, and um, the result of these measurements basically is uh, that you can make a distinction between, um, as you can see here, the um, uh, letters there uh, stand for utterance initials, the utterance initial consonant, the intonation phrase initial consonant, the accentual phrase initial consonant, the word initial consonant, and the syllable initial consonant. So if you had in all these positions you had a T or an N. You can see that going from left to right, the contact time or the, the, the contact range is getting less and less. So at the beginning of an utterance, um, the consonant T at the beginning of an utterance uh, unit is articulated with much more contact, much f forcefuller than the consonant T when it occurs within a word at the beginning of a syllable. Yeah, the, as you can see, the percentages are partially kind of very, I mean, 59% contacted and 58% contacted. You can ask whether that's really a real difference, but overall, and that has been mostly investigated for French Korean and English, uh, there seems to be some kind of uh, uh, correlation between the contact uh, intensity, the, the, the um, articulatory strengths of certain consonants in uh, dependence of the unit uh, they belong to. Um, I think that's a very interesting kind of um, possible evidence for word boundaries as well. Um, but um, given the uh, apparatus you need uh, for doing the measurements and also the quantity of kind of measures you can do, is this obviously not a practical, if you wanted to find out uh, uh, a thousand words in language X, then uh, it's not really, uh, <coughs> yeah, you basically, at the, at the current stand of the, of the theory and the measures, you basically already have word segmentation and intonation unit segmentation, and then you can find out something about these uh, um, differences. But it's still important, I think, to um, take note of the fact that um, words um, may also manifest themselves behaviorally in these types of, in these kinds of distinctions. Okay. Um, Coming now to the real um, um, major point of evidence, the primary data source for words, and this will come as a, uh, a puff, uh, as a disappointment. Possibly, <laughs> it's it's basically it's uh, it's rather low uh, uh, technology. It's um, sp speaker input in elicitation and transcription. Um, and this will sound trivial, trivial to many of you, especially people who do field work, but I think it hasn't really been talked about enough um, in the discipline. And some of the knowledge that was around when Sapir and Boas and Bloomfield were dominating linguistic theorizing, um, some of the things that were clear at that time don't seem to be clear anymore today. Um, and that's basically uh, what I'm trying to reinstall in basic knowledge and basic procedure. But we can also say that in the sources from Boas, Sapir, Bloomfield, it hasn't been totally clearly articulated what I'm going to say right now. So what happens in word list elicitation? Basically, speakers name or provide labels for objects, persons, properties, and events, as you um, all uh, will know. And this is something that can be applied in any language, quite obviously. Um, and um, this is the more important point and something which one, in a certain way, if one really wanted to put linguistics on a proper 
empirical footing would need to do some kind of empirical study. It is largely consistent across speakers and sessions. Yeah, it's, uh, it may not be surprising to you, but I mean, if you think about what can happen in fieldwork in various settings, about when you run certain experiments, when you work on sentence uh, structure, things that there's very different behavior and knowledge levels of speakers. But I think word elicitation is something any speaker can do, and they do it consistently. They don't uh, do it one day this way, and the other day they come up with a new, uh, with another idea. At least that's my um, own experience. If you, as experienced field workers, have other experiences, that would be the interesting point for me today in this lecture: whether we share here. Uh, experiences or not. In principle, I would still claim that it, as I just mentioned, it would warrant some more research what actually happens in this word elicitation, yeah, in a, in a, in a documentary style approach where one re actually would were to take uh, uh, recordings of how you negotiate uh, certain things in these settings. I will come to that s um, shortly. Uh, but for me, um, the important point is that in word elicitation, you basically form um, an idea of what the words in a certain language are like. And they are basically, uh, when you compare words across languages, the, the reason why you can compare them at all is that they both, that they, in all languages, you, com you are comparing their result from the same procedure. So, um, as you probably will know that in recent years um, there has been a major discussion on how to compare languages, what's the basis for the comparison, etc. And there's always the question, is it more behavioral evidence or is there certain structural evidence we can use for that? And my, my claim here is that uh, um, Word list elicitation is basically the comparative concept, as it were, for, for comparing words. And the comparative concept basically consists in the fact that you do the same kind of procedure. You ask people for labels for things. Yeah? That is basically uh, ensuring that you are talking about the same type of entities. Uh, yeah, so... Um, that basically is an answer to the question: um, What all units and uh, what do all units that we call words in different languages have in common? Namely, that they basically arise or occur in word elicitation. Yeah. In order that they actually can serve in this function, they have to be. Uh, uh, um, the responses should be reasonably consistent, replicable, and shared across the community. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah. Just a quick question: How do you get uh, little aspect markers and all these pesky particles? You don't. You uh, or you get them in a different way. But then the question is, of course, are they words? Yeah. So. The, the point is, what you get in elicitation, and I will um, show, I mean, this is not t t totally straightforward. I will discuss uh, two major problems in a second, and then it will be clear, I hope. The first possible compound is, um, from my experience in word elicitation, is that you basically can get two types of responses. The one response is the label you want. So you ask, you show, you show a, a rock or a stone and you say, What's, how do you call this in, the, in your language? And then the person says, stone. But then there are speakers who kind of do not want to, to label. So you ask them, how do you call this stone? And they say, look at this stone or how big the stone is, or stones for building ovens, or something like that. Yeah, it's not. They they kind of refuse to make the abstraction to to give you a label. They give you the word in context, 
And that's, of course, not going to be helpful for uh, in, in the function of having a comparative concept word by the procedure. I have to say, I mean, one notices the difference fairly uh, immediately. I mean, if you, if, you, if you start working with a speaker who uh, is in the second uh, level, you get much too long answers to your question. It doesn't take you long to notice that there's something else is going on there. Um, but the claim would be that in all communities, there are speakers, or most of the speakers, normally do uh, answer type one. They give you labels. At least, I mean, I have worked with hundreds of native speakers, and one was an obstinate kind of utterance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I didn't work very long with him. It was just, I mean, it was. You, you can't proceed on that. Yeah? You, get, you get utterances with very little indications of what the possible segmentations are. Um, this distinction between the two, uh, these two basic answer types in the recitation uh, should be distinguished by, uh, from the fact that, um, of course, depending on the language and the concept you are asking for, the answers can be morphologically complex. Yeah, this is standard uh, experience and knowledge. I mean, or also uh, recommendations for field work. Don't start your elicitation with kin terms. Yeah, you get uh, immediately kind of possessive pronouns. Kin terms and body parts are not the best words to start, or the best concepts to start word elicitation with. Um, and of course, event expressions in many languages you will not get uh, an uninflected form. You will typically get forms which are tense, aspect, uh, 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 mood inflected or person inflected, etc. But this is not a problem. I mean, this is basically actually exactly why um, I'm saying the, that the elicitation tells you what the word is. Yeah? In, in languages where you get pure labels without any grammatical trappings, you basically will, in the end, argue that the word consists of this basic root. And in the languages where you consistently get possessive pronouns, etc., you will have to say that the grammatical word, or at least one section, one part of the grammatical words, uh, consists of a root and uh, an affix for person, etc. Yeah, that's exactly wh what you actually do. Um, and. Um, of course, this morphological complexity is addressed in morphosyntactic analysis, and that gives you uh, then the grammatical word. And you, in order to analyze this further, you make assumptions about affixes and or clitics. The important point uh, for me here is that normally the kind of units you get in these elitations, even if they come with ver the various um, grammatical um, trappings, they will not, um, when you kind of further analyze them, you will not end up with two words at the end. Yeah, it's not that you, you in, in this analysis, there, there is stuff which may not be part of the base form of the word, but it's not that you have two or three words when you um, um, uh, do this further analysis. Possible exceptions are compounds. Uh, and um, furthermore, just to... Um, come back to actually the issue that was just raised. It is not the case that when you do recordings of sentences and, 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 and texts, that you can um, segment the intonation units if you use your recording and then you do into the intonation unit segmentation and then you try to do word segmentation. It is not the case that the word segmentation uh, allows you to uh, segment the string, whatever it is, uh, without residue. Yeah, and there may be temps, tense particles and discourse particles and other things hanging around somewhere, and that's some some challenge then to further to further analyze. Yeah, but the the important point for me uh, is that I think that if you want to understand to study word structure, you basically have to ask people for basic labels and see what kinds of answers you get and take it from there in the further analysis. This, in many ways, as I already hinted at, is, is more almost 
the classic definition by Bloomfield um, of, um, uh, of what a word is. A minimum free form is a word. A word is thus a form which may be uttered alone with meaning, but cannot be analyzed into parts that may all of them be uttered alone with meaning. That's um, the, the long version of um, Bloomfield's word definition, which um, um, <coughs> which um, um, has this minimum free form criterion as uh, at its uh, um, center. This um, definition is very often, or this criterion for wordhood is very often interpreted in textbooks um, uh, or explained also in textbooks and also other types of um, morphological works um, in terms of questions that you basically say the possible answer to questions like what are you looking for, sugar, then this gives you word-like units. And of course, I just said we, we do this for word elicitation, but I think it is very important that you actually uh, be precise about what type of question is actually productive for <coughs> identifying and defining uh, the prime or being a primary datum for word-like units. So um, I don't think that any type of question is the type of question that actually is relevant for the minimum free form criterion of, of uh, Bloomfields. Uh, rather, for on the one hand, uh, is that you can have questions like, did you say dyslexic or alexic, and where you can have this as an answer or a, possibly, and you can <coughs> um, construct similar questions as well. But I think <coughs> even more importantly, um, what I have been calling this word list elicitation questions, the question for a concept is actually geared at the metalinguistic knowledge of the speaker. And it's uh, something different from enacting a question answer sequence like, uh, what did you see this morning, uh, shoes or something. That's a different thing. If you ask, how, what is the name or the label for this or that item or this or th that event type, that taps into something very different. Uh, so, um, basically, I would say that the um, minimum free form definition of uh, Bloomfield is the one which is actually productive uh, for, for defining a word with this clarification that we are talking not about any type of questions, uh, but rather about uh, responses to concept questions. Um, then we basically arrive at uh, the fact that elicited words are primary data which only native speakers can provide. Yeah? If we uh, define them in this way, the, the native speaker is basically uh, the major source uh, for um, this um, datum. And in terms of further analysis, typically these answers to elicitation questions are answers that come uh, the, 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 the units that emerge, they are probably um, um, typically combined phonological and grammatical word properties. Uh, yeah, so and the separation of these two different uh, types of uh, properties is then um, the task of the further descriptive or structural analysis. In terms of comparison um, between different languages, uh, the results of such further descriptive analysis to, uh, with regard to grammatical words and phonological words, um, are, they are comparable, yeah, addressing this issue of how can we dis, dis, uh, compare uh, the word type units across languages if they come from the same type of primary data yeah, and if the same type of analytical procedures are being used then you basically can also compare your grammatical words and your phonological words across different languages. I'm belaboring this point um, a little bit because um, I think this has been misrepresented in uh, recent work um, and misunderstood in recent work in various ways. So for example, Martin Haspermard says, uh, asks whether it is necessary to use our skills as linguists to identify words or whether we can simply ask speakers what the words in their language are. 
This possibility is sometimes suggested in the literature. For, for example, Coserio simply asserts, nous estimons la notion de mot comme, in, comme intuitivement établi. And according to Aronoff and Fudemann, speakers literate and illiterate have clear intuitions about what is and what isn't a word. But it is unclear what the basis for this optimism is, what the basis is for this optimism. And I think this is a misrepresentation of, or, or misunderstanding of uh, how the pro process works and what actually the role of the native speaker is. Without the input of the native speakers, you don't have primary data for uh, analyzing words and then you can't compare them across languages. Um, elicitation is the, is, the, is the process or the, the situation which is the one where word definition, as it were, word recognition, as it were, uh, happens most commonly. But there are related kind of activities that have also been mentioned um, in, the, in the literature. Uh, Sapir um, says, uh, the naive Indian, quite unaccustomed to the concept of the written word, has nevertheless no serious difficulty in dictating a text to a linguistic student word by word. He tends, of course, to run his words together as in actual speech. But if he is called to a halt and is made to understand what is desired he, desired, he can readily isolate the words as such, repeating them as units. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't have much, in, no, I have no, I don't have any experience with dictation. Um, we don't do that anymore since we do recordings and then, uh, huh? Depends on the kind of language. The, depends different. on the kind of language, yeah. So I don't have any uh, experience there, but this is a, I mean, it's the same type of uh, evidence source for words as elicitation. Yeah, with a slight variation, a bit more modern, but I also don't have any kind of um, experience with that, is this um, idea of re-speaking uh, with the app um, that uh, Stephen Bird um, developed a few years ago and which has been taken up by colleagues here in uh, the CNIS, uh, where BS basically speakers listen to a, a recording and speak it more slowly, probably in word type units, or they could be made to speak it in word type units, I suppose. Um, so that would be another type of um, evidence uh, for uh, um, primary um, f for for words on a on a primary data level, and uh, finally. Um, there is, of course, transcription, my uh, favorite topic these days, um, which also provides evidence uh, for the uh, word on, as a minimum free form, um, as it uh, was now just um, defined. Um, this is, however, not, it is not as bad as many people seem to believe, but it's of also, of course, not really a straight good a straightforward source of evidence for word units for a number of reasons. The one reason is in literate societies uh, how people write, uh, are transcribe is, uh, is very strongly influenced by the written standards and it is, uh, especially in countries um, like uh, the one I work in, Indonesia, it is not so clear what happens um, in these contexts of emerging literacy. Yeah? So people, almost the youngest generation, the youngest two generations basically, have grown up learning to write, mechanically at least in school, but I don't think that they are literate societies yet, but still there are ideas around how written language should look like and that kind of uh, may cause interferences uh, for spoken word um, um, candidates identification. Conventions play um, a role in transcription uh, to a larger degree as then um, um, then um, often uh, um, considered and um, I will f also have a few words to say about variability uh, in transcription which on the one hand um, creates problems but on the other hand may also provide uh, interesting insights. Um, let me just um, re reinforce this point by Biber and, uh, and colleagues on uh, the fact that transcription is a highly conventionalized practice especially in, in, in literate societies um, as we are here. Um, 
and that is um, um, there you can get this um, spellings like gotta gonna cause etc but they typically do not really um, uh, provide uh, anything close to how the things really sound yeah there, there are conventions that you write ain't uh, for what for something that typically sounds mnt or something like that um, variability um, is clear we you find variation in the sense that some people write going to and write gonna got to got or uh, etc these are standard um, variations in English transcripts for German prob probably French you would say the same thing Biber says in fact a tribe's choice in writing say gotta rather than got to is likely to be significant in reflecting pronunciation um, that's what we what one would think but I think that should be tested really at some point uh, that um, uh, people really uh, I mean what the factors are when people actually shift different kind of shift between different kinds of of transcribing the same form um, from my uh, let me just uh, ask about is what's it's the time 20 to 6 or something yes. okay uh, time is passing faster than I <laughs> than I thought. Um, I already showed this example uh, last uh, week, uh, yeah, where we I had a speaker by chance basically transcribe the same recording twice, and there is interesting kind of variation between the two um, record uh, the two transcriptions. Yeah, where um, the, the main point here is the, the sentence is on is I, mehen is the base form for sit in singular, uh, to when is some what uh, we analyze as an auxiliary person tense suffix when for the first singular presence. And um, in one go, the speaker made. <coughs> The, the, the complex predicates sit and the auxiliary complex into two items in the first line and the other one he wrote them together. Yeah, and this is a problem that in many uh, languages, in Papua languages, uh, recurs again and again. And um, what I'm interested in right now but haven't really properly done is to actually look more closely at what um, uh, happens uh, in terms of variation here. So if we just look at this one uh, example, there are 21 uh, examples of complex predicate forms in the whole recording. 17 of them are consistent across both transcriptions, so both times the same decisions were made. But in, f in four of them, so fairly small number of items, it was not consistent. It was like in the Mehente Wen example that in one transcription it was two words, in the other transcription it was only one word. The whole thing has to be looked at in the context of the verbal morphology of IHA, where we basically distinguish three types of uh, inflectional setups. The one, the first one, as uh, exam shown in the first example, Mon Mehenem Mehenbe where you have a root and a person tense suffix yeah so the base form plus a suffix this is never written separately that's always one unit that's a reason to say this is a suffix yeah why because you don't so here transcription actually gives you a reason to say why you call something a suffix because it's consistently written as one word and um, then there are two different uh, construction types, one with a stem former and a person tense suffix and one with an auxiliary and a person tense suffix. That's the second and the third examples. We don't have to go into the details here. The point is the variation occurs with regard to these constructions. Yeah? So this is um, <coughs> the, the important point is that the variation in transcription writing is limited and it can be helpful in the analysis with regard to those points that uh, where uh, writing practices are consistent uh, across different settings and speakers. 
Um, so let me basically, the final points are very fairly straightforward or are straightforward. Uh, <coughs> the, but they are still important points, although I mean they are, I think, uh, very obvious and well known. The variability we are observing in these transcriptive practices, but also in <coughs> trying to determine what uh, is a suffix and what is a clitic, um, etc., is, is to be expected if we believe in grammatization. Yeah? So, if it is the case that languages continuously kind of grammaticize grammatical markings, it is to be expected that we find formatives which are somewhere in the middle of something. They are, not yet, they are no longer real words, but they are also not yet real suffixes or affixes, but they are somewhere in between. So it's actually, one should actually expect the variability one can see in terms of word segmentation, both across languages, but also within a language, because if there is this dynamic process, then this is actually what um, is to be expected there. Okay, I think I stop here for now. Possibly I will come back to these final points next time. Okay, thank you very much. The main points were presented.